overwhelmed, sir, mm -hmm. by your uh, esteemed present presence here with us today evening, Dr. Anindya Sinha, a great primatologist. But I will also, I read that you're MSc Botany, right, sir? That's right. That's right. <laughs> so yes. we all coexist uh, together. Absolutely. But um, uh, people say that uh, this is crisis and Corona has uh, done great harm. But I think for those uh, who are interested in learning, this has given a great opportunity to do a lot of self-learning and to look within yourself. Somewhere we got lost and in that process, uh, this is one opportunity somehow which has come to us to explore how we can look around ourselves and look what we can contribute in our own simple way to the society. On behalf of Junyunwala College, I request our uh, fledgling principal, I say, uh, Dr. <laughs> Manchu Davda, to give the formal uh, welcome address. Thank you, Usha Madam. A very good evening to everyone present here. Uh, on behalf of Hindi Vidya Pachaya Samiti's Ramdhan Junyunwala College, uh, I extend a very warm welcome to our guest speaker uh, for the day, Professor Sinha. Uh, I also extend my uh, hearty welcome to members of uh, Association of Teachers in Biological Sciences. Junjumala College and the platform of Junjumala College uh, in the field of basic sciences, the knowledge exchange and the research is uh, known to many of us for more than five decades now. And uh, thanks to the enthusiastic teachers and the students that we have here, that even this lockdown period, we were never separated from each other in terms of knowledge sharing, whether it was a month of March and April, we had a guest lecture series from different field, whether it was the month of May and June, we had guest lecture series of eminent physicists and uh, astronauts uh, and the uh, researchers from the field of physics in association with uh, IAPT. And now uh, this uh, initiative on the DBT Star College scheme. I would be failing in my duties if I do not thank you at the outset and the beginning of the series, our beloved uh, director and the former uh, principal, Dr. Usha Mukundan. You saw the enthusiasm that she has, which uh, slowly and unknowingly also gets percolated into us. I would also be failing in my duty if I do not thank uh, uh, Dr. Pushottam Kale, Kale, sir, from whom also we have learned a lot while he was with us in the department. And I'm thankful to each and every person who has uh, been a part of our journey in uh, growing and evolving with time. So thank you, everybody. I now uh, invite uh, Kale, sir to formally introduce our guest speaker today. And sir, we are very eager to listen to you, Senha, sir. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Thank you, Dauda, sir. Namaskar, everybody. I'm Purushottam Kale, Secretary, Association of Teachers in Biological Sciences. And I've retired from Junjunwala College well, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Anindya Sinha. He is currently Dean Academic Affairs, National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bangalore, and is an adjunct faculty of another six national and international institutions. Professor Sinha obtained his degree in botany and post-graduation in cytogenetics from Calcutta University. He then did PhD in molecular biology, working at Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. His early research has been on behavior of wasps, social cognition in macaques, classical genetics of human diseases, philosophy of human, non-human species relationships at center of ecological sciences, and um, of the Inst Indian Institute of Science and National Center for Biological Sciences, 
both at Bangalore. His current research interests are also diverse. He works in animal behavioral ecology, cognitive ethology, evolutionary biology, population and behavioral genetics, urban animal, uh, urban animal studies, mainly primates and other mammals, philosophy of biology, performance studies, and intangible as well as tangible cultural heritage of India. He is on various national and international organizations in various capacities. We are fortunate to have such a distinguished and accomplished speaker for this inaugural session of webinar series organized by Ram Niranjan Junjunwala College, Ghatkopar, Mumbai, in collaboration with Association of Teachers in Biological Sciences. I'm happy to tell you that Professor Aninja Sinha is vice president of this association. Well, I request all the participants to use chat box for sending their queries and questions, which will be answered after the presentation is over. Let me now request Professor Aninja Sinha to give his presentation. Thank you. Uh, I've been associated with all of you for quite some time now, and it's a pleasure, but I must tell you that it's an honor that you chose to invite me for this lecture, and I know that this is the beginning of a series, uh, so thank you very much once again. Uh, it's truly wonderful to be here with you. I wish I could be there in person, but this, I guess, is the next best thing we can do in these difficult times. Now, be uh, before uh, sort of um, uh, let me also just, before I start my talk, let me also say that I've been working with primates for uh, almost 27 years, a little more than 27 years now, and uh, I hope I will be able to give you a glimpse of the different kinds of questions, research questions and insights that we've been able to obtain uh, with our studies. I'm sorry if the acoustics is not very good. Firstly, this is, I'm speaking from home, and it's raining heavily outside. So there may be some disturbance in the audio. So if you can't hear me, please do let me know and I will uh, try and change that. Uh, so let me begin uh, by, uh, so the, the I've titled my talk, Primate Worlds from Complex Communities to Simple Minds. And I just wanted to give a feel to uh, the younger members of the audience, especially who are beginning their work, uh, their research careers to say that uh, research in biology, the beauty of biology, really lies in a huge number of levels at which questions can be asked. And many a time you find that questions asked at one level will percolate down to other levels. And so if we have to understand the life of a monkey, in my case, I've been spending a lot of time with them, uh, you will realize that we have to ask questions at various levels. But before that, let me just sort of uh, briefly uh, uh, talk to you ab about the Indian primates. Uh, India is very rich in its primate fauna. And I've listed here a series of all the species that we find uh, in um, uh, India of the different groups. Mates. And what you will see is that if you look at the families, uh, there are three broad groups. The first group is, of course, that of the Lorisidae. Who, which are usually solitary, nocturnal, small-bodied uh, primates. We have two species here, the slender loris and the slow loris. The slender loris in southern India and Sri Lanka, uh, the slow loris, of course, extending from northeast India into southeast Asia as well. And then the next broad group is what is represented by the family Cercopithecidae or the monkeys, and the monkeys, of course, are broadly into two groups, the macaques and the langurs. If you look at the macaques I have listed, there are right now eight species that I have listed here, though we have a ninth species now, apparently, the white-cheeked macaque, which was discovered only about six or seven years ago. And a report of it being found in eastern Arunachal Pradesh 
uh, was published two years ago. So we now have nine species of macaques. We have five species of langurs. And of course, what differentiates between them is that the langurs are largely folivorous, feeding on leaves and flowers, occasionally fruits, whereas the cercopithecini or the macaques uh, typically uh, feed, are omnivorous and feed on a wide range of food uh, materials, ranging, of course, from plant materials to meat as well. And finally, we have a species of this, what is called the lesser ape, the hulog gibbon in Northeast India. Uh, of course, it now seems that there are two subspecies of the hulog gibbon. Some people call them species, the Eastern and the Western hulog gibbon, and both have been reported on either side of the Brahmaputra in Arunachal Pradesh and, and in Assam. Right. Having said that, let me come to my own work. And what you will realize, and this is what I was telling you about, is that when I started working on uh, primates, I started really working on minds. My interest was in cognition. I wanted to understand the evolutionary biology of the mind. And I did not want to study primates in the laboratory. I wanted to study them in nature, in their own natural habitats, because you realize that when you study species or individuals or populations in their own natural habitat, you get to see much of their traits that have evolved over time. Unfortunately, sometimes we do ask questions in the laboratory or in captivity, and those are very important questions can only be answered there, but they were not of my interest because I was interested in evolution. And I know that when you bring an animal into captivity, into a cage or into a semi-natural context, you basically curb the animal's behavior, you stress it out in many ways, and therefore you may not actually be able to see much of the natural behaviors that are of interest to some of us. So here I have listed, and then, uh, sorry, so what I then wanted to say is that as I started studying the minds, I realized that unless you study the individuals, you can't understand their minds, but the individuals don't live alone. They live in societies, just as we do. And when you look at these societies, you realize that they are a part of a much larger population where evolution takes place. And then, of course, if you're looking at different populations, you're clearly getting insights into species. And when you start understanding the species, you find that they don't live on their own. They live in large communities, right? And therefore, even so, my argument here would be that if you wanted to study minds, you would need to study communities. And if you wanted to understand communities and how the dynamics of communities work, you may need to understand individual behavioral decisions. You may need to understand minds as well. So that is what I meant. And in today's talk, I will very briefly touch upon different aspects of my work that cuts across these boundaries and which I now think are artificial boundaries because they merge into each other. And since an understanding of one level of organization requires you to ask questions at other levels of organization, they really form a very integrated whole in a manner of speaking. So let me start with my work on communities. And this work actually has taken me to the northeast part of the country in northeastern India. The uh, lowland evergreen forests of the Brahmaputra Valley in Assam are some of the last evergreen forests of our country. They are heavily fragmented and face major conservation problems. But at the same time, these forest fragments, and we've studied 46 of these fragments in the upper Brahmaputra Valley, are remarkable. They're remarkable because some of them are as small as five or six square kilometers, but they harbor a very rich primate life. Some of these uh, pri the uh, primate richness in these fragments parallels that of the Amazon forests, right? So in one of the fragments that we've studied uh, primates for a very long time now, uh, almost 18 years, is uh, what is called the Gibbon Holongapar Wildlife Sanctuary. And there are eight species of primates, including four species of macaques, the pictures of which I show you here, in just about 18, one eight square kilometers of forest. However, what seems to be happening very tragically 
is that Northeast India, which is so rich in its primate diversity, and you don't have to bother too much about the map, but I've just shown how many of the species of primates that we have in India are actually found in the different states of Northeastern India. Uh, but the tragedy of this is that many of them are slowly going locally extinct. So if you look at the primate communities in the Podumoni fragment, uh, which I've shown the data here for, over just a period of 10 years from 1995 till 2005, there was a complete local extinction of the three species of primates that you found here. So is all lost? Unfortunate, fortunately not. So if I look at another fragment, the Borajan fragment, which is actually close to uh, the Podomoni fragment, not very far from it, you find that here there were five species of primates and all of them persist even today. Of course, I've shown you data only till 2005, but I think they even if you go there today, 15 years later, you will continue to find these five fragments, but all of them may not be doing the same. Although in this graph, I show you that the population, uh, the numbers, individual numbers of these primates seem to have reached a kind of stability since over the last 15 years, some of them have indeed gone up like the rhesus macaque, but the pigtail macaque, the Assamese macaque have unfortunately come down. What is fascinating is that the Hulog gibbon, which is an ape, is very, very well protected by the local communities. They consider it sacred. They do not kill it for any reason. And therefore, Hulog gibbon numbers are doing very well there. So, to, so the kind of questions we've been asking about these primate communities, and I think this is true across primate communities, wherever you study them uh, in India, is, and I've listed them here, what are the factors that have promoted such remarkable primate diversity in these lowland evergreen fragments? Although these fragments, as I said, are just some of them are just five to six square kilometers. Why is it that only one or two species have not survived? Why is it that we still have this diversity? Why, how have they coexisted in spite of the rapid degradation of the habitat? Is there niche specialization? In other words, are the species that are present in these fragments distributing out the resources, space, food, water, in ways where they minimize competition, they minimize the interspecies interactions, and therefore they are, in a manner of speaking, able to survive, coexist together. And of course, the last question that I've listed here is, how do we save these last primate populations? What kind of management and conservation strategies do we need to develop over time? How do we take away the dependence of the local human communities on these forests? for their resources? How do you take away that dependence? What kind of alternate livelihoods can we provide to these people so that perhaps even the forest primates can remain safe in the future? So returning back uh, to my, um, and if any of you have any questions specifically about the different aspects of the work I'm talking about, I'm sure there will be ample time at the end of this uh, talk for me to have discussions. And I don't tire easily, so don't worry about that. We can have longer discussions at the end of this talk. Right, now moving on, so let's go to the species level. And I want to tell you the story of one particular species, and this is the Arunachal macaque, or what in scientific literature is called the Macaca munzala. Uh, this is a species that we actually discovered in a manner of speaking in 2005. So ever since EPG uh, discovered the golden langur in uh, 1958, 1959, there have been no new primate species discovered uh, in India till we reported the Arunachal macaque. And this um, therefore in some sense leads to the appearance or the scientific reporting of a new species of primate as recently as 2005, about 15 years ago. Now, let me tell you a brief, something very briefly about the Arunachal macaque. It is encountered at a very high altitude, extending up to 3,500 meters in the Eastern Himalayas in Arunachal. And this is the highest altitude recorded for any macaque in the Indian subcontinent, and perhaps one of the highest in the world. 
Typically, this species is found in subtropical broadleafed oak rhododendron forests along the rivers in degraded open scrub forest. And what was remarkable, and this seems to be true for most of the macaques uh, that we have studied and in general for this group of species, very close to human habitations and croplands. Uh, we found when we did our survey in 2004, 2005, 2006, we found about 35 multi-male, multi-female troops were observed, and the troop size ranged from five to 35 individuals. They were very shy and wary in the presence of people. And what was remarkable is whenever they no spotted us, they would jump down from the trees into the undergrowth and then escape through the undergrowth. And this is very different from what you see in the lungus or the colobine species that I talked about earlier. They will always move through the trees. Of course, some of the wild macaques will also do that. So if you look at bonnet macaques or rhesus macaques, and if they're truly wild, they are largely arboreal. But however, as they get used to people, they start becoming terrestrial. But I will come to this in a, uh, in a little while. Now here, therefore, uh, I report, uh, I'm showing you the slide where how in 2005, we reported this to be a new species, but there are two points of interest that I want to mention here. And these are two lessons that I learned in the course of this work. The first is, of course, when we reported the species, for it to be taxonomically accepted as a new species, I'm sure many of you are aware, we need to have specimens. But we, and this is my colleagues from the Nature Conservation Foundation in Mysore, uh, we were very, very reluctant to actually kill an individual. Uh, for this purpose. We felt it was not really worth it. And so I went through the, um, the International Code of Zoological Nomenclature, uh, looked at it, the entire volume, and there I found in small print something that was very exciting. Basically, it said that if necessary, if absolutely essential, you can report a new species on the basis of good quality photographs. And that's what we did. So if you see the two pictures on the top, you have the holotype on the basis of which the Arunachal macaque was, report, discover, was uh, described. And below you find three other individuals from the same troop, which we recorded as paratypes. The second point I wanted to make about this particular discovery is that when we were thinking of a name for it, right? So it was, of course, the genus Macaca. Uh, what would be its name? And the various suggestions came forth from all our colleagues, our friends, our family. And it was an exciting time. And then uh, we decided, because this was something that had been very inspirational for us, we called it Munzala because that is the name the Dirang Monpa people who live in the Tawang district of Arunachal Pradesh, where we discovered the monkey, call it. Mun is deep forest in their language in Monpa. Zala is the monkey. And we thought that the specific name should be the vernacular name of the species for one simple reason, that the, these communities knew this monkey far, far longer than we mere scientists found and reported them. And therefore, in order to uh, sort of respect the traditional knowledge systems that exist in our country, especially in that part of the country where this monkey was reported, we named it after their name, right? And so it became Makaka Munzala. And the lesson that I learned from this, and I think it's very, very important even today, is that never ignore traditional knowledge systems. Do not test them always using your current knowledge because they may have evolved under different circumstances. They may have different kinds of uh, formalities, different tenets, different philosophies. And we, unless we get deep into it, unless we understand their frames of reference, I don't think we will really be able to discover the richness of the traditional knowledge systems. Uh, and since then, right now in my work on urban ecologies, uh, I have, uh, in accordance to certain ideas that have been coming through in the field, uh, uh, we started reporting what we call vernacular ethologies. I'm sure many of you know that ethology is the study of animal behavior. But when you do vernacular ethologies, you're basically asking the local communities who have themselves interacted with many of these 
species, uh, animal species for long periods of time, we try and understand what they know of these species, how they interpret the behavior of these species, which is very different from the traditional ethological thinking that we have brought in through our Western science. And I can assure you, many of these vernacular ethologies give us very rich insights. I'll give you one last example, mahouts and elephants. Mahouts and elephants have had such a long relationship, but very rarely have we tried to understand what is it that mahouts know about elephants? How do they, are they able to communicate with them? How are they able to control them? How are they able to interact with them? And I think we, dis, we neglect these traditional knowledge systems to our own peril. One day we will lose them. And we need to therefore start documenting many of this long, uh, long before they go away. And therefore, I can very proudly say that we did not discover the species at all. It was known to traditional communities in that region for centuries. We only gave a scientific report of it. And I think that way of looking at it will open up your world to many, many insights that will come from people who we may not consider educated, we may not consider them literate, but they are wonderful observers, they are wonderful thinkers, they are wonderful philosophers, and I think there is so much to learn from them that we have neglected so far. Let me now move on and talk a bit more about the evolutionary biology uh, of the Arunachal macaque, which is, of course, as I said, restricted to the eastern Himalaya and Arunachal Pradesh, but it forms a part of what we call the Sinica group of macaques. Now, the Sinica group of macaques has actually five species. It has the Arunachal uh, macaque. It has the Assamese macaque, of which there are two main subspecies, the western Assamese macaque and the eastern Assamese macaque. And then you have coming down the bonnet macaque of South India. You have the a uh, toke macaque, which is endemic to Sri Lanka, and one species, the Tibetan macaque, which is found only in Tibet and some other parts of southern China. And the question we then asked, both morphometrically as well as genetically, is where does the Arunachal macaque fit in to the Seneca group of macaques? And as many of you may be familiar, when you do these phylogenetic trees, you construct what are called gene trees, you can use mitochondrial sequences and you can use nuclear sequences. We chose mitochondrial sequences and sequ a sequence from the Y chromosome of uh, these primates to do our analysis. And why did we do that? The mitochondrial sequences, as many of you may be aware, the mitochondria are inherited maternally, right? So the mitochondria in your genome comes from in your cells comes from your mother. So by looking at the evolution of the mitochondrial sequences, we basically trace out maternal ancestry. On the other hand, you know that in the mammalian way of sex determination, the Y chromosome is typically present only in the males. And hence, if you're able to trace out the evolution of sequences on the Y chromosome, you will be able to perhaps examine the paternal inheritance, inheritance patterns. To cut a very long story short, when we looked at the mitochondrial sequences, and I will explain this in a minute, what we found, and I'm not going into the technical details of what we did, but I can, we can discuss that in the discussion if necessary. What we found was that the Assamese macaque, and this is the Eastern Assamese macaque with samples from Burma, Myanmar, in Yunnan, in China, in Vietnam, and other parts went with the Tibetan macaque. And you might expect this because the Tibetan macaque is also found in Tibet, which is now, of course, officially a part of China. And so they went, their sequences of the mitochondria went together, showing that they had the same maternal origin. But what was absolutely fascinating is that the Munzala, which you see just here, the third picture from the top, the Munzala's maternal origin is common with the bonnet macaque of South India. The bonnet macaque is also the macaque that you see in the wild in Bombay, around Bombay, in the Sanjay Gandhi National Park, though, of course, there are some introduced rhesus macaques there as well. So this told us a fascinating story that the Munzala, though it is found in eastern Himalayas, in northeast India, much closer geographically to the Assamese macaque or the Tibetan macaque, was actually far more related to the bonnet macaque of South India rather than to those macaques. When we now went to the Y chromosome, 
we use the testis specific protein uh, factor on the Y chromosome, which is typically inherited by males. And this is the tree we found. And what's fascinating is, of course, the toke macaque of Sri Lanka, the bonnet macaque went together, as you would expect, because they are both found in the southern part of the Indian subcontinent. And this time, the Tibetan macaque, the Assamese macaque, and the Munzala went together. Right? So that tells you a fascinating story. And remember, therefore, that the Munzala, which is on the bottom right in your screen, the Munzala is much more closely related maternally to the bonnet macaque, which is second from top and found in South India, but paternally, it's much more related to the Assamese and the Tibetan macaques. So what is the kind of story that we have? So using the mitochondrial and the Y chromosome sequences, uh, we reconstructed the evolutionary history of the Arunachal macaque. And don't bother too much about the details of this. Basically, what we found is that the origin of the entire Seneca group of macaques actually happened in what in an ancestrally in what is now modern Myanmar, Burma. There, the proto Seneca arose about 3.2 to 4.5 million years ago. And one branch, the proto Assamensis Tibetana, went off northwards and later crystallized out into the Assamese and the Tibetan macaques. The second branch from the proto Seneca in Myanmar actually went westwards and formed the proto Munzala Radiata Seneca from this group about three to four million years ago, the Munzala branch went north and colonized Arunachal Pradesh, whereas another branch came down into south, into peninsular India, forming the Makaka Radiata, or the Bonnet Makak, and Makaka Sinica, or the Tok Makak of Sri Lanka. This last separation of these two species happening about 170,000 years ago, fairly recent. One thing then is how is the Munzala such a cousin of the bonnet macaque and of the Assamese macaque? And what we think has happened is that around 1.8 to 1.5 million years ago, the females of the proto Munzala stock that you see here hybridized with a group of Assamese or macaque, Assamese macaque males which had emigrated from westwards, from Southeast Asia into India. And this hybridization of the Assamese fathers and the proto, the proto bonnet macaque mothers led to the development of a hybrid genus, uh, species, the macaca munzala. And what is fascinating is that this hybridization event seems to have taken place around 1.5 to 1.8 million years ago. Today, it's not possible because around that time, the river Brahmaputra took up its modern course and effectively separated, as it does today, the western part of the distribution of the Seneca group of macaques with the Eastern. So the Tibetana and the Assamese, Eastern Assamese have remained restricted east and south of the Brahmaputra, whereas the Munzala, the Radiata, the Tok macaque of Sri Lanka, the Western Assamese macaque have remained isolated from the other group by the river Brahmaputra. They are distributed west and north of the river Brahmaputra. So therefore, this tells you how a hybridization event may have led to the development of a new species. But physical boundaries like the Brahmaputra River make sure that such processes may not happen again. They become natural barriers to the movement of populations and hence any chances of hybridization that may happen. The story is, however, not complete. It's a bit complex, more, a bit more complex, and I'll just take one more minute to talk to you about this. This is when we went further east. We went into central and eastern Arunachal Pradesh to see if we could find the Munzala there. And what is remarkable is we found two kinds of skins of macaques, which we call the Upper Suban City macaque and the West Siang macaque. Uh, they are from the Upper Suban City District and the West Siang District of Arunachal Pradesh. What is also very interesting is that the Monpas of Western Arunachal Pradesh do not feed 
on the macaques. They do not consider macaques as their food. But many of the communities that live in the other parts of Arunachal Pradesh hunt and kill the macaques for food. And so we were not able to get live uh, pictures of live individuals because they were extremely shy. They would disappear even when we were about 700 or 800 meters from them. But we were able to find skins. And using the skins, we did morphological analysis and genetic analysis. We also found skulls and we compared the skull characteristics, the skin characteristics, the color with many of uh, across these different taxa. And I won't go into that story, but what I want to show you is just this. When we did a genetic analysis of these two uh, kinds of uh, individuals, uh, the, uh, the two kinds of macaques, and this I've shown you the mitochondrial DNA, what you find is something fascinating. The upper Subansiri macaque is monophyletic with the Arunachal macaque, as you might expect, because it's geographically very close. But the West Siang macaque, which is found further eastwards in Arunachal Pradesh, is monophyletic with the bonnet macaque of South India. What does it mean? It means that if you go back to the tree, and I'll just quickly show the tree again, it seems that the upper Subansiri macaque branched out from the proto Munzala that you see right here in the middle. From there, it moved north and separated out from the Munzala, but maintained its genetic relatedness. However, the other one, the West Siang macaque, actually evolved perhaps from the proto Munzala radiata sinica stalk much earlier. 4 million years ago, and then took its northern route and separated and remained. So from this Proto-Munzala radiata stock, it must have gone north and then further east into Arunachal here, right? So therefore, you have these two macaques, which are very close to each other in geographically, but actually having their evolutionary origins from completely different stocks. And that was a fascinating story. So what, how, so what, what do we summarize from here? It seems, therefore, that the macaques of, east, of Western and Eastern Arunachal Pradesh and the Himalaya seem to be of multiple origin. And historically, they have been isolated from one another in their mountainous habitats. However, they seem to have undergone very rapid relatively rapid morphological changes, some which, of which were convergent, others which were divergent, leading to differentiation and extensive incipient speciation. In fact, I didn't have time to tell you this, but the Assamese macaque that we find in Tawang district, but at the much lower altitudes is morphologically completely different from the Munzala. They're much light brown in color. They don't have any of the markings of the Munzala. The local communities also consider them a different species, just as we do as primatologists. However, when we did the genetic analysis, we found that those Assamese macaques and the Munzala are genetically identical across all the loci that we studied them, both mitochondrial as well as Y chromosome. That tells you that even though they are come from the same genetic stock, just by being distributed at different altitudinal zones, they undergo rapid morphological changes, and this seemed to have given rise to different species. Now, how do you define species? Do you define it genetically? Do you define them morphologically? If you use either morphometric characteristics, as we often do, if you use genetic characteristics, as we often do, you will see that the Arunachal Pradesh macaques, all the macaques, that I showed you pictures of in Arunachal Pradesh may all form different kinds of species groups, just depending on what you are using as the criteria. So what does that mean? Does it then mean that there is nothing called a species? We know that this is true for the genus. The genus is an artificial sort of construct that we have made by putting together related species simply because of our ease of classification of our ease of conversing with one another, talking about genera. And so here, while I was doing the study, I really questioned the species concept. And maybe I can bring this up again in the discussion later. But while I was doing this, I found a remarkable quote. And the quote is this, in short, we shall have to treat species in the same manner as those naturalists treat genera who admit 
that genera are merely artificial combinations made for convenience. This may not be a cheering prospect, but we shall at least be free from the vain search for the undiscovered and the undiscoverable essence of the term species. What does it mean? It means that perhaps the species doesn't exist. There is no, there is an undiscoverable essence of what it means to be species. Maybe the species is just like the genus. And who was the scientist who made this comment? Charles Darwin. And this is remarkable. Charles Darwin in the book, The Origin of the Species in 1859, towards the end of the book, completely turns around and says that, look, I've spent a lot of time describing what a species is, but perhaps the species doesn't exist. It's perhaps just convenient for us to consider what we think is a species. And maybe we have to rethink what that is. He said this in 1859, and it has taken us more than 150 years to discover that perhaps Darwin was right. Right. So let me move on. And uh, let me now come to three categories where I will talk to you briefly about one aspect of my work. And this is where I cover the range from populations, societies within these populations, and of course, the individuals who live in these societies. And this takes me to perhaps the species I know best, because I have spent now, as I said, about 27 years almost living uh, with the species. And this is the bonnet macaque. Now, the bonnet macaque is endemic to peninsular India. It is found across a wide range of ecological habitats, uh, ranging from montane evergreen forests to deciduous forests to scrub jungles. You found, find them in the coastal flats. You find them in human habitations. There is virtually no town or city in South India, <clears throat> extending up to Bombay, actually, where you don't have the bonnet macaque. Right now, they are usually found in multi male, multi female groups that vary greatly in size and social complexity. And let me just tell you that I forgot to mention this earlier uh, that the macaques are a remarkable group of species. As I told you, that we now perhaps know about 22 or 23 species. There's some controversy. What is remarkable about these 23 species is that they together form a genus which is the largest non-human primate genus. What is also fascinating about the macaques, these 23 species, is that they are distributed and their geographical range is the largest amongst all primates with the exception of humans. So they're second only to humans in the kind of proper uh, ecologies they occupy. But what is also fascinating is of all the species within the 23 that we have studied, most of them can hybridize with each other. And therefore, going back to the species concept, what do they represent? Do these great variety of 23 species of macaques by Ernst Meyer's um, theory of speciation, are they all one species? Because by the biological species concept, different species are supposed to be reproductively isolated from the others, but the macaques are not. But we can bring that up again later. Moving on about the bonnet macaque, we have a project, uh, and I want to highlight here the importance of long-term studies on a common species such as the bonnet macaque. So this is a 25-year project, which began in 2000. We've just begun the 21st year of this study. And uh, this is actually looks at the demography, behavioral ecology, the cognitive abilities and the life history strategies of this population of macaques. We are following about 30 troops in Bandipur and Mudumalai, wildlife sanctuaries. <clears throat> and as I said, this is the 21st year of this study. We now know 2,000 individuals by face, and we have been monitoring them. Now, clearly, all 2,000 individuals don't live together because over time, many of them have died, they've disappeared. New individuals have been born and have joined this population from elsewhere as well. And what I show here on the right are five males from five different troops of Bandipur. And as you can see that they have completely different hairstyles, right? So you can make them out easily. But what I also want to convince you is that these five individuals, as do the other 
2,000 individuals that we've studied, they're completely different from each other in their behavioral traits, in their ecologies, in their life history strategies, in their cognitive abilities. Each is a remarkable, unique individual, just as we humans are. And until we do long-term studies, we will not discover that. Let me not take too much time on this, but very briefly tell you that troops of completely wild bonnet macaques are now rarely observed in the forest. They have all come along to the roads and they become permanent residents on these roads simply because of us. We as tourists, when we go through these highways, and I'm sure you've seen this everywhere, we feed the monkeys. And once you start feeding the monkeys, it starts off a process of what we call synurbization. They start becoming urbanized and their lives have changed forever. And very briefly, this is what we find. We now find that in Bandipur and Mudumalai, almost 50% of the macaques that we see live in a very unique unimale group, social organization. Typically the groups, the typical groups are multi-male, multi-female, but now we are seeing a number of unimale groups which have only a single adult male with several adult females living together. And we think that the most important reason is that the provision food from tourists, which is rich and clumped, lead to intense competition between females within the troops. And because of this competition, they now break up into smaller groups. And once you have small groups of females, it is possible for one male to monopolize reproduction of these small groups. And we have now ended up with the unimale social organization. What is remarkable is with this social change, we also have change in the behavioral repertoires of these individuals. And what I have compared here is the behavior along different uh, axes, and I'll talk about that in a minute. We are comparing the single male in a unimale, multifemale new organization that we are seeing with the alpha male, which is the most dominant male in the group of number of males in a multi-male, multi-female organization. And when we compare that, so we are comparing the adult male in a, of a unimale troop with the alpha male of a multi-male troop. And when we look at reproductive monopolization, it is complete because there's only one adult male in the unimale troop and he mates with all the females. However, the alpha male shares reproduction with the other males present in the multi-male group. So therefore, aggression and competition is much lower in the multi-male group, but it's much more regular and intense in the unimale group. In fact, the single male of the unimale group has also begun a novel behavior, which is that of active herding of the adult females. He actually will chase and keep his females together, driving them off from other males. And this is how he's able to maintain the single male composition of his group. Whereas the alpha male very rarely does this herding, only occasionally do you see the male doing this. When you then look at active troop defense, when males are defending their groups against other males from joining them, the, it's very common for the single male to always participate in this intergroup encounters. But the alpha male never does it. Right. So all the other subordinate males go and encounter other males and between and when we have intertroop encounters, they fight each other. But the alpha male always stays behind with the females. He has that prerogative being in a dominant position of never involving himself in a fight. And therefore, what you then find is that because of this very aggressive uh, prevention or a defense of the group that the single male in a unimale group shows, you find that immigration by other groups is prevented. Males are not able to join the single group male groups, though there are many more females there, they are much more attractive, whereas in the multi-male groups, their immigration happens very, very commonly. So there is no prevention of immigration at all in these multi-male groups. And from this, because these changes in social behavior, in behavioral profiles have happened only within the last 20 to 30 years, we think that this may not be genetic. We think that this may be a manifestation of what I think increasingly we should pay attention to, which is phenotypic flexibility. What do you mean by phenotypic flexibility? It is the context dependent, reversible phenotypic transformations that we see in behavior of an individual in response to change in ecological and social environment, 
right? So the change or the phenotypic flexibility that I'm talking about, change in the behavior in this particular case occurs within a single individual. And it often becomes an advantage in terms of individual fitness when these animals are able to move across these different behavioral profiles. This behavioral flexibility then gets integrated into the life histories of individuals. And of course, this integrated behavioral variability will then be subject to typical natural selection. And therefore, I think when we now look at animals, and this could be elephants, which we have also been studying, which are now forming new kinds of social organizations in the crop fields of Karnataka and Tamil Nadu, whether we are referring to dolphins, which live within the bay across the coast from Cochin or Goa, are able to adapt themselves to tourist boats, whether we talk of urban animals who are able to so clearly uh, adjust themselves, or if I'm talking of Maharashtra, what about the leopards, all the Maharashtra leopards now live virtually in agricultural fields, whether they be of shock, uh, sugar cane or whether they be of cotton. How have they been able to adapt? Part of it, of course, is genetic, but part of this is phenotypic flexibility. And let me just end this part of my talk with how we see phenotypic flexibility in bonnet macaques. If you look at the upper leftmost distribution here, there is an unpredictability in food abundance and distribution. And then there can be several things that can happen. You can have on the right a group vision where females are leaving the groups and female emigration was never known in bonnet macaques till we reported it. And when females move, you end up with smaller group sizes. And once you have a smaller group size, it may be possible for there being flexibility in male behavioral and emigration strategies, because now you may have end up with unimale or with multi-male situations. Of course, independently, and I've not been able to show you the data here, the unpredictability in food abundance and distribution can lead to flexibility in female social strategies, depending on their dominance rank, even within the group. And individuals completely change their strategies when they have different kinds of food resources. And finally, this female emigration that we find takes another form. Once you have an unimale group, females are deprived of mate choice. They are forced to mate with that single male in that group. And this now has led to a flexibility in female emigration strategies where young females often leave the single male group alone and go and join other multi-male groups because they have a greater mate choice there. So this kind of complete flexibility in the behavioral strategies that we see across these uh, one population of macaques over the last 30 to 40 years tells you how remarkably important phenotypic flexibility is in understanding behavioral decision making. But in zoological thinking, unfortunately, we have been so obsessed with genetic evolution that we have completely neglected phenotypic flexibility. Let me now come. I have uh, I've spent about 45, 46 minutes speaking. And so let me come to the last part of my talk. And if I can just take 10, another 10, 12 minutes, I will finish. But before that, let me conclude uh, this part of my talk. So basically, human interactions with macaques of the kind we see in Bandipur or in Mudumalai, including a very simple act of feeding monkeys, which you see everywhere, whether you go to Sanjay Gandhi National Park, or whether you go to any of the temples around Bombay, you will see us feeding monkeys, but they can have profound effects on their behavioral ecology at two organization levels, at least in this case, that of the society and that of the individual. Born in macaques are, however, unusual in exhibiting remarkable social flexibility and a wide variety of individual behavioral strategies, all of which enable them to successfully adapt to very different socio-ecological habitats, including what I call disruptive anthropogenic regimes. Even when humans come in, offer them completely different kinds of food, they break, cut down their forests, they break, build new buildings, the bonnet macaques are still able to adjust and adapt to them. However, I've not shown you the data, but what we think is that this change is not good for the macaque if we consider survival. If you look at the unimale groups of bonnet macaques in Bandipur and Mudumalai, they are much more susceptible to predation. They are much more prone to accidental deaths from vehicles. And what we see is that although the multi-male, multi-female groups continue to be stably present, 
over the last 20 years, unimail groups, which keep forming, also keep disappearing. And therefore, we perhaps need to have effective management strategies for the species in protect protected areas like Bandipur or Mudumalai with tourist macaque interactions, but also in rural and urban areas where there is severe human macaque conflict and where we find that there is very little hope for the survival of the primates. So we definitely need to bring in new management strategies, but the most important of that is not to feed monkeys. They do not do well. You bring on more conflict, they get used to people, and they ultimately leads to their disappearance. So, so I think this is extremely an important point that we must consider, and we must consider the implications of management and conservation implications of our various studies on the various species, because otherwise we will lose these species and their populations forever. Finally, in the last part of my talk, I want to talk a bit about how I studied the mind. Uh, in this case of the bonnet macaque. And the important questions about the mind of the macaque really comes from this. And these are some of the questions. What is it like to be a monkey, right? We know what it is to be a human, but do we know what it is to be like a monkey? And let me tell you, this is the single most important reason for me to actually start studying cognition or the primate mind, because I was interested to know what does it mean to be a monkey? A second question, which is evolutionary, how did we come to be what we are today? If the human being has been able to take on such a dominant position in today's biosphere, primarily driven by the human's mental capacities, what, where lies the evolutionary origin of, this capa of these capacities? Can we understand neurobiologically how the primate brain works? And finally, and this I'm sure is important for all of us, will our knowledge of the primate mind influence the way we relate to them? I know that if I tell you that the chimpanzee feels pain, you will desist from ill-treating a chimpanzee. You may treat it in a much more humane way, especially when we do experiments. If I tell you that the fish feels pain, perhaps it's, we may still continue to eat fish, we may still continue to do experiments with them, but perhaps we will be more temperate in the way we respond to them if we know what their mind is like, what are the cognitive capacities they have, right? And this is basically the main goal of the different studies that have tried to look at the mind. We have looked at a variety of cognitive mechanisms which underlie complex social processes, and uh, some of them are social knowledge of how monkeys are able to acquire knowledge of each other, how do they abstract such knowledge, how do they conceive of themselves as individual beings? And I will not have time to talk about all of this. The second is that of intentionality and tactical deception, which I will talk about a bit. We've looked at referentiality in multimodal communication. So when macaques are communicating, do they indicate particular parts of their body? Do they indicate other events in their environment? We have looked at tool manufacture, mechanical intelligence, and how tools uh, may be fashioned because of an insight into the, their functioning. And finally, we've looked at behavioral flexibility, which I talked about briefly, social learning and cultural traditions, which many of these populations have been able to set up. Unfortunately, as I said, that I don't have too much time. So in the last uh, eight or nine minutes that I have, I will just talk a bit about our work on intentionality and tactical deception. Now, what is the philosophical basis on which we ask questions about the primate mind? And intentionality is one of them. Daniel Dennett, who is a cognitive scientist and philosopher in a series of papers, actually put forward what he called the intentional stance, which is when, and let me just explain this to you. So when any being, and it could be you, and it could be me, when any being has a specific mental state, which could be a belief, a desire, an emotion, a memory, a want, it has a mental state, right? And if you have a mental state, you become an intentional being. There is a certain amount of intentionality associated with your mental states. Now, as you will see, that the moment I bring about this question of mental state, I have already brought in the concept of the mind. 
The mind is very difficult to define. But let me now, for the purpose of this talk, call it a mental state. So if you have a belief, if you're bored with my talk, if you're thirsty right now, if you want to say, I want to switch off on India's talk, I don't want to listen to him anymore, then you have a mental state, you become an intentional being. But when you are an intentional being, you can perhaps differentiate between different levels of intentionality. Now, let us look at a very common behavior that our macaques show, which is when they see a leopard, they immediately give an alarm call and they rush up the trees, right? Now, other individuals who have not seen the leopard but hear the call of the macaque will also rush up the trees, right? And the question you can ask is, is the, why did the bonnet macaque give an alarm call on seeing the leopard? If the bonnet macaque gave it because of a simple stimulus response, kind of a response, then it is a zero order intentional being. I see a leopard, I give a call. I hear a call, I run up the trees. It's just as you cross the road. You look left and right simply because you know that there may be cars which may come and hit you. You've just learned that, right? In, of course, in that case, it's not zero order. A zero order is when you are your knee jerk response or when you blink, when a finger comes towards your eye, that becomes an instinctive behavior. You become a zero order being. But you then have a first order intentionality when a subject has beliefs, but it has no beliefs about other individuals' beliefs. So a bonnet macaque gives an alarm call because it believes that there is a leopard there, but it has no idea about other individuals' beliefs. However, you could be a second order being when the bonnet macaque, if it is a second order intentional being, will have some idea about the leopard. And it also knows that if it gives an alarm call, others will start believing that there is a leopard there. So as you see, there's a recognition of mental states of other beings coming in when you're a higher order. The final higher order is the third order, which is what humans are. And here it will be like this. The bonnet macaque gives an alarm call because it wants other macaques to believe that she believes that there's a leopard there. In other words, if I'm talking about this talk, I want you to believe that I know what is coming in the next slide. You don't know what's coming in the next slide, but I know what's coming in the next slide, right? So I can make you believe in what I know or what I believe in. And that's third order intentionality. And you'll immediately recognize that we require third order intentionality to teach. If we require third order intentionality to have the conversation, right? And therefore higher order intentionality requires the ability to represent simultaneously two different states of the mind, that of the actor and that of the audience. I know that I know certain things, and I know that you do not know certain things. <clears throat> I'm therefore able to recognize a discrepancy between my intentional state and your state. I know that I know, I know that what's in the next slide. I know that you don't know what is in the next slide. So I can recognize a discrepancy between our two mental states. And what's fascinating is that just as we require higher order intentionality to converse or to teach, we also need it to cheat, right? And this you see here. So a human-like deception requires the actor to create a false belief in the mind of the audience. And the author, actor then recognizes the audience's mental state can be changed. I can tell you that there is a wolf in my sheep pack. And I can make you believe in the wolf, though I myself know that there is no wolf there. That is human-like deception. What you find is that bonnet macaques or other primates are often able to use an act from the normal repertoire of the act actor in a situation where it is likely to be misinterpreted by the audience. And the actor then benefits. And I'll just give you a quick story. A dominant male is chasing a subordinate male, and he suddenly stops, and he stands on his hind legs, looks into the distance and gives an alarm call. Immediately, the, and I can see that there are no dogs, there are no leopards, there is nothing there. Immediately, the dominant male stops chasing him, starts looking for the leopard and the subordinate male runs away. 
So here is the act which is used from the normal repertoire of the actor, but in a situation where it is likely to be misinterpreted and he benefits from it. The important question is, can some of these acts of what we call tactical deception be genuinely intentional in that the actor attempts to change the mental state of the audience? And again, I don't have much time to talk in great details about this, but let me tell you that when you want to look at uh, uh, tactical deception, you will see a context in which deception occurs, and you will see that there's a certain behavioral category, a certain behavior that the animal uses to actually deceive in that particular context. Some of the contexts could be in terms of sex, some in aggression, some in food, competition, some in affiliation, and these are the behaviors that you see, so the, the goals you see. So when in the case of sex, I may want to disrupt the sexual pursuit of another individual, I may pursue my own sexual interest, I may avoid a sexual advance from another individual, and similarly, there can be various other contexts in which deception can be shown. Now, what are the behavioral categories? Now, again, I don't have time, unfortunately, but I just want to give you a feel. And all of this comes from natural observations. There can be affiliative behavior, threat behavior, non-responsive behavior, inhibition of interest, non-contextual behavior and calls, neutral behavior, diversion of aggression, all of which become functional categories of behavior that are used to bring about deception. Just to give a previous example that I gave you, will fall under the category of non-contextual behavior and calls. An alarm call is a very, very important call. But if I use it out of context, I stand on my hind legs and give it in a completely different context, I can then use this behavior to fool another macaque who stops chasing me. Right? That's what I meant. And what is fascinating is if you look at the relationship between the contexts that I talked about and the functional categories, you find that in each of the contexts that I talked about, which is shown on the x-axis, a large number of behaviors can be used. So different functional categories of behaviors can be used in a particular context. You also see this kind of generalization the other way around. You can take one functional category, let's say affiliative behavior, and you find it can be used in a large number of contexts. So therefore, you find this generalization that the individual macaques are capable of, where they can take a particular behavior and use it to deceive in a number of contexts. And for each context, they can use this or a number of other behaviors to fool someone else in that context. And what I show here is the number of events that I see of tactical deception on the x-axis, on the y-axis are the behavioral categories used. Each dot that you see is one individual, and this data comes from three troops of macaques that I had studied over a period of almost four years. And what you find there is that as the number of deceptive events, number of events go up, as you see on the x-axis, there is a positive correlation with the num kinds of behaviors that you use. So if you look at this individual here, not only does he show a large number of deceptive acts, he also deceives using a large number of behavioral categories. And this I show here. Now here is on the y-axis uh, is uh, all the males of a particular troop, B1. PK, HL, GDPI were adult males. And when I studied them for a while, there were hardly, there was just one act of deception that one of the males showed. But then HSOS, DSTW were four subadult males who came and joined this group after almost eight months of my studying them. And in the last three months that I studied them, these were the huge number of deceptive acts that these individuals started showing. These are new individuals, inexperienced individuals. They've come into a new troop for the first time and they immediately start showing deception. In fact, if you look at this individual HS, I show how HS was so flexible in the way he showed deception. The black will be the context, the red will be the functional categories. So when he wanted to avoid aggression, he could use inhibition of interest, he could use affiliative behavior, he could use non-responsive behavior, he could use a non-contextual call. In fact, that call that I told you was shown by HS. He could also use non-contextual call in a completely different 
domain to disrupt the sexual pursuit of others. He sees one male chasing a particular female. He just gives a leopard alarm call. That's all he does. And immediately the male stops chasing that female. And so he has therefore fooled that male and been able to deceive him, right? He also can use threat behavior to disrupt sexual pursuit. And he uses affiliative behavior to advance his own sexual interest. So as you can see that the life of a bonnet macaque, if you just look at deception, is remarkably complex and he's able to use it in a large set of situations. So let me just conclude and finish. So different functional categories were used by certain individuals to deceive in a particular context, while the same functional category could be used in different contexts. Several young and otherwise inexperienced individuals displayed complex deception involving a number of acts in different categories performed in quick succession. Some males displayed novel behavioral categories of deception to achieve novel goals following changes in their social environment. When they went from one troop to another, they completely changed their repertoire of deceptive behavior. And therefore, we think that perhaps individuals are just not learning and predicting each other's behavior. They are most probably also mind reading, and they are able to change the mental states of other individuals when they deceive. We also find that the variability, the generalization, and flexibility in tactical deception that we see in bonnet macaques indicates a very strong cognitive basis in this complex decision-making process. And possibly, if you go back to the intentionality levels that I was talking about, bonnet macaques may be second-order intentional beings. They are perhaps not third-order beings as humans are, but they do have intentionality of a slightly lower order. And finally, we find that sometimes they show behavioral components that are not compatible with their apparent belief system. And I'll just tell you a story. There was a male that was about to mate with a female on top of a tree. And there was a second male on a neighboring tree who was watching this. He gives an alarm call. Immediately, the male and the female on this tree, they separate from each other. What does this male now do? He descends from the tree, moves towards the other tree, walking along the ground, giving the leopard alarm call repeatedly. Now, if you see a bonnet macaque in front of a leopard, if there is actually a leopard, you can be sure that the bonnet macaque will not descend from the tree for the next two days. Here, on the other hand, when he was deceiving, he actually came down from the tree. So when I saw him down on the ground, I knew immediately that there was no leopard. He also perhaps didn't understand that he shouldn't be giving that call when he's on the ground because then it gives away the fact that there is no leopard. However, because the other individuals watching him also have an incomplete theory of mind, they don't recognize that this is evidence that there is no leopard. They think that if there's a leopard alarm call, there must be a leopard there. And therefore, this apparent belief system is a little faulty. And it's interesting that if you look at human children, they learn how to deceive over time as they grow. They don't necessarily know it right from the time of their birth. And I'll give you just a small example with uh, my twin children uh, who are now much older. But when they were about four or five years old, we were teaching them how to play hide and seek. And we hid our daughter behind the curtains. And we said that our son will come and look for her now. And she shouldn't make a noise. And she said, OK. When our son actually came in looking for her and she was hiding behind the curtains, I just called out and I said, don't make a noise. And she said, all right. So what does it mean? It means that she recognizes that she shouldn't make a noise, but doesn't recognize fully that by saying it aloud, by recognizing my communication, by acknowledging it, she's giving herself away. So it took time for her to learn how to deceive. And I think for bonnet macaques and maybe other primates, they may have evolutionally been stuck at that stage where they are not perfect deceivers anymore. So let me end by this little quote from Malcolm de Chazal, who was a very famous uh, French humorist from the island of Mauritius, not very well known, but famous in his own circles. And he said this, he said, monkeys are superior to men in this. When a monkey looks into the mirror, he sees a monkey. Right? And I just want to say that when I look into the mirror, I see a monkey as well. Thank you.
amazing Okay, so first question is from Sanika Gupta, who says, uh, "Do you name them like Jane Goodall?" And uh, I think uh, it's a very important question. Yes, we name them, but you know, Jane Goodall came under a lot of uh, criticism because she named her chimpanzees after people she knew, and the criticism was that when you do that, you're perhaps ascribing traits or behavioral patterns to these individuals, depending on. who those individuals you've named them after right so what we do so the japanese have gone to the other extent they call them a1 a2 a3 a4 b1 b2 b3 all of which is fine but that's very unimaginative you can't remember them always so we have a neutral way of giving them names we call them cut tail white cheek uh, long hair and there may be a long hair's daughter long hair's granddaughter so we have names like that so which immediately we remember the names because they are based on their characters but they are not based on people and therefore we are not ascribing any particular behavior to them uh, then usha ji i think uh, you have written uh, have you observed what fruits leaves they eat when they are not well especially if they have a stomach upset and also any special food before or after childbirth Uh, oh thank you for your kind comment as well uh, no uh, i have seen them on one or two occasions they actually picked up a bark they took up a bit of a bark and they rubbed them on their eyes i have seen two individuals in two different groups do this i have no idea what they have why they did that i have not noticed any change in diet before birth or after <clears throat> but let me tell you about very briefly about the work of a very close friend and associate of mine professor michael huffman who's at the primatological research institute in japan in kyoto university and mike saw he has studied self medication in chimpanzees and he finds that when they have a stomach upset they use they do not chew they roll up leaves with their hands first and then with their tongues and they swallow intact leaves what is fascinating is when he examined their fecal samples later he found that these entire leaves rolled up leaves had emerged along with parasite eggs and adults so perhaps it was a way of physically pushing out uh, parasites uh, when they had infections but he also talks of other kinds of pharmaceutical qualities of food items that they take but unfortunately i have not studied yeah, separate branch zoo pharmacology correct mm-hmm. correct I have a student who is doing a PhD actually with Mike, but I am a co-guide, uh, and uh, she works on Himalayan langurs. Her, her name is Himani Nautial. She is in Himachal Pradesh, uh, studying Himalayan langurs. And one of the things she is trying to look at is self-medication. But she seems certain specific food items being taken at certain times, but we don't often know the reason for that. But that is an important question, I think. Uh, Purushottam ji says, "Can we say that natural selection is being interfered by human selection, or is it that human interference in natural selection is influencing the direction and evolution?" Absolutely right on both counts. Yes, human selection, or what Darwin called artificial selection, does come in. And if you look at domestic dogs, domestic cats, many of our domestic species, we have. consciously or unconsciously much like the hybridization experiments in uh, plants in agriculture we have selected for certain traits right so when you choose a puppy in the, from a litter you're always choosing someone who understands your signals better who's perhaps more friendly and in this way we have led to certain dog breeds having certain traits and that is by artificial selection when you say does it interfere with natural selection let's look at it this way they move from a natural environment when they move to the city they're moving from a situation of 
uh, a natural selection to a situation where there's perhaps more artificial selection in a way. I won't call it disruption. It's just that it, it's different. And is it influencing the direction and evolution? Of course. When we look at phenotypic flexibility, when we look at many of these behavioral traits uh, that individuals are showing, this is directly in response to certain selection conditions brought about by human food, brought about by human uh, infrastructure, which is leading to evolutionary change. Okay. Uh, okay. So Usha ji again asks, would you take a little more on defining a species? Uh, I don't think a species exists, frankly, <laughs> because if you use uh, different kinds of criteria, you will end up defining a species differently, as I said. Now, and, you know, I have a small piece that I wrote up for Nature India, uh, which I can send you if anyone's interested. But basically, I looked at the tiger-lion hybridization that Calcutta Zoo experimented with in the 1970s. We ended up with a tigon, which was a cross between a male tiger and a female lion. I'm sorry, the other way around, the male lion and a female tiger, the tigon, and then the tigon, according to the theory of biological species concept, will be sterile. It wasn't. The tigon was okay. fertile and mated with male lions, a female tigon mated with a male lion to produce a litigon, a lion tigon cross, litigon. Unfortunately, the litigon did not live to be adulthood, so we don't know whether it was fertile. But even if you don't, even if the tigon itself is fertile, does that make, according to the biological species concept, the tiger and the lion as the same species? No. Morphologically, of course not. But biological species concept, yes. All the macaques interbreed with each other and produce fertile young. Are they all one species? Right? So I don't think we should get into this debate. Yes, taxonomists can get into this debate, and I think it's fascinating, the philosophical aspects of it. However... Yeah, just... Go ahead. Can I add one thing there? Go. I don't sure. know, because today you spoke, I, I, I will go back and read. I have not read much about, or sure. for that matter, anything about it. Has anyone done any barcoding type of work? Yes. On these, yes. Uh, yes, they have. Okay, and then I will go and read. Correct. And if you use barcoding, you read. will be able to define species. But then you have to close and you can say that, yes, using these barcoding criteria, this is how I define the different species. However, then you have to close your eyes to the biological species concept and you have to close it to the yes. morphometric species concept. So therefore, <laughs> I, I, a little catch line that I use for my students is that the species concept is great for conversation. So that when I say a tiger, you know what I'm talking about. It's also great for conservation because we don't care whether it's a different species or not. We need to conserve. But if you're talking of evolution, I think it's time to talk of populations. It's time to talk of individuals. Those, that's where evolution is taking place. Let's not get into these sterile debates of what is a species or what is not a species, because in the process, we will lose them all. Let's look at the population. If the population is in, unique, if the individual is unique, it is worth thinking about, it's worth researching, it is worth conserving. I think that's the philosophy I will go by. Right. Uh, then um, I think, um, uh, sorry, uh, ah, somebody asks, uh, oh, somebody, I think Sivan, Mr. Sivan, he asks whether the question of the role of the definition species can be applied to prokaryotes. It looked at very differently because typically the species has been defined in the domain of sexual reproduction. So if you leave aside that, if you're talking only of vegetative propagation or a sexual reproduction, then perhaps the species needs to be looked at differently, though we know there are mating types and there are other kinds of strains that can cross uh, at least transfer DNA or not between them. So I think it is a requires specialized uh, uh, looking at it. Uh, Mr. Rajkumar Divakar asks, can they be carnivorous? Yes, they do take spiders, um, other arthropods, insects, bird eggs, uh, lion tail macaques feed on lizards. Lion tail macaques are also known in the Western Ghats. They're also known to cooperatively hunt uh, for mouse deer. Uh, so apparently, so they can be quite uh, carnivorous in that sense. And um, is phylogenetically, are they associated with human mode of nutrition? Uh, I don't think so. I think the resemblances that we find, of course, there could be some amount of phylogenetic inertia, but much of it may be more local ecological adaptations. 
uh, uh, DNS asks, in spite of dwindling plant species or food resources due to habitat loss, the natality and fecundity of primate population, particularly the macaque, is maintained at high level as observed in Assam. Please comment on it. Not necessarily true. The rhesus macaque is able to actually colonize a wide variety of habitats, and they are very, very prolific. However, we do see that species like the pigtail macaque or the Assamese macaque, which are much more arboreal, which are much more limited in the kind of food they have, are the population sizes are uh, decreasing not only through lower fecundity, lower at least surviving young, also perhaps because of lesser number of troops. In fact, it's tragic, but in Gibbon Wildlife Sanctuary, where we started off with eight species of primates, in the sixth year of our work in 2008, the Assamese macaque went locally extinct there. So part of the reason, of course, may have been that they, were, they had dwindled to a very few individuals and these individuals finally left the patch. But uh, it can affect them, is what I wanted to get at. Um, um, Purushottamji says, you see a monkey when you look into the mirror, but after listening to your talk, I feel my mind is reduced to a monkey's mind. You couldn't be more right than other than anything else. You, it is true. If you look at it, if you strip away culture, right? When you're in the bathroom or when you're alone and you say, you know, I could kill that individual, right? You're actually giving in to a very natural biological instinct. It's only because when you come out of the bathroom and then others come around you that this veneer of culture comes over you and you say, oh, my mother taught me never to beat anyone up. I shouldn't kill anyone up. And then you become a human being, right? But deep down, let's not forget the genes play a role. The genes are there. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and we are there for macaques deep down as well. Of course, that doesn't mean that any behavior that I show, if it has superficial resemblance to a behavior that a macaque shows, has exactly the same genes acting or the same cultures acting. Maybe not. Those may be superficial. But can we deny that deep down we share genes, right? We are 99% genetically similar to the chimpanzee. And aren't some of these genes at least responsible for our behavioral strategies? I think they are. Right. Um, uh, then uh, I think Bindu asks, is there any peculiar group behavior to protect themselves from natural calamities, say flood? I don't know. I don't know. It is true that it has been believed. Okay, so let me tell you this. Uh, we've been also working with the Nicobar lion-tailed uh, macaque, uh, Nicobar long-tailed macaque uh, in, um, in the Nicobar Islands. And when we spoke to some of the people who were there during the tsunami, they said, that even about 12 hours or some 10 hours before the tsunami hit, the macaques had moved inland, right? Now, and only I think two or three people said this. Now, whether that was just one group moving to a tree behind or whether it was really a widespread movement, I don't really know. But it is true, and I have seen this myself, and start moving, and I'm sure many of you have seen this, and start moving their eggs and larvae to a new area just before the rains come. They possibly detect the humidity, or it could be the wind factor that they detect. And I think perhaps in some sense, animals may be sensitive to a wider range or a different range of environmental stimuli. And maybe there has been selection for them to act in ways appropriately to what they sense, whether it's by pulsation, whether it's by what they hear, whether what they see. And therefore, it may not be wrong to think, to hypothesize, that they may be responding to natural calamities well before we understand uh, that. So I think that's all I can say uh, for the time being. I think uh, Deepak Pujari asks, uh, do monkeys behave differently with a member of their clan who is different in appearance, say, for example, an albino individual? I have seen, I've not seen any albinos, but I do know when individuals are injured or not able to walk, for example, there's a certain amount of curiosity. Uh, when an infant, for example, gets injured, I have seen more individuals other than the mother showing an interest in handling such an infant, licking the wound, smelling the wound than they would if the infant wasn't injured. But if you're talking about more natural variability, for example, in pelage color or in gait 
or in other behaviors? I really don't know the answer. However, I'll tell you one thing. Uh, you know, one of the as part of our demographic work in Bandipur, when we when we have to identify individuals and we look at the birth sex ratios and infant survivability. We have to identify infants as soon as they are born because they could be dead the next day and we will lose a data point. Now, it, it's very difficult to identify an infant when the mother is really clinging on to it, the sex of the infant, I mean. <clears throat> One of the things we find is if any adult male in the group shows an interest in the infant and comes to the infant and tries to, uh, uh, you know, accept it, uh, tries to touch it or whatever, it's almost 99% sure it's a male infant. They are just not interested in female infants. Adult males in the group are only interested in male infants and they help us identify the sex of the infant just by their behavior. So I don't know whether, again, uh, Deepak, this may not be the exactly the right kind of a question, but uh, answer, but perhaps uh, that's uh, uh, what it is. Okay, uh, there's some questions from YouTube. Let me quickly go through. Sangeeta T says, can we say these primates are reflective of human behavior and the cognition uh, and the cognition in context? Yes, they are reflective. The primate mind is reflective of the human mind in two ways. One is evolutionally, perhaps we have gone through that stage in our ancestors, and therefore, evolutionally, perhaps they reflect a stage of human ancestor, human ancestry. The second thing I will say here is that in our own personal development, as I gave an example right at the end, perhaps we go through stages of development, which are very reminiscent of what non-human primates are capable of doing even as adults. But we then move further when we develop, and we then take on capacities which perhaps these species phylogenetically have not been able to evolve yet, right? So that I think uh, would be how I would say that it is reflective of human behavior in some sense. Again, the other way of looking at it is when I take a certain decision, there's a certain cognitive mechanism, right? And I'll just give you an example. So uh, we learn instinctively to close our eyes when a finger jabs us, right? That's instinctive. Let's look at an example of a learned behavior. When you cross the road, your mother has told you or your father has told you, look left and right, otherwise you can get hit by a car. So when I'm driving a car or when I'm crossing a road, I can be arguing with you at any to any extent, but I keep doing some of these very complex behaviors. I change the gears. I press the brakes. I look left and right when I'm crossing the road. So clearly, these are learned behaviors. And I'm sure macaques do the same. However, when you and I are crossing the road while arguing, if I suddenly say, let's not look left and right today because today is Sunday and there is no traffic on this road on a Sunday. We've gone beyond our learning to actually reflect on the true situation. And so we are rationalizing our behavior. That's a step forward. And what we find that in the case of the macaques, even if they don't rationalize the way humans do, we do find that they have gone beyond instinct, they go beyond learning, and in many cases, they actually take information of what they know about the physical or their social environment, and they use that information while taking a decision in an integrated way. So therefore, they are fairly complex, and I didn't have time to talk about that, but they are definitely quite capable of taking complex decisions on the basis of complex stimuli, not a simple one is to one stimuli response, nor learning in just one domain, but perhaps a little more integrated and beyond that. Okay. Uh, uh, Bimal has a question. Uh, thank you very much for your very kind comment. Two small questions. Do you think incipient speciation is going on in Arunachal and Makaka Munzala? Maybe differentiating evolutionally into incipient species and their future possibilities of hybridization events and resultant speciation under sympatric conditions? Absolutely. Absolutely. Very, very true. However, what will then come in is what I think Purushottam Ji asked earlier. Human factors, human interventions will perhaps disrupt some of these processes that you talk about, which are very, very valid uh, points. And those processes may then stop 
simply because we are hunting them, we are killing them, we are isolating them into smaller populations. And therefore, many of the hybridization events may not happen. They may not be subject to the kind of natural selection that otherwise they would have. Perhaps human interventions will bring in a different set of features, environmental features, to which they will start adapting. And many of these so-called natural processes will go away. Having said that, philosophically, you can also argue that the presence of humans with whom they have shared the environment for centuries is also a part of their natural environment, right? So if you go back to Tamil Sangam poetry, which is about 2000 years old, you hear of monkeys living in the town's commons. So clearly for 2000 years, these animals have lived with us. They have adapted to our changing conditions. And that's what we are st studying in our urban ecology project. And therefore, whether this is now artificial selection or do you consider the human influences as a part of their natural selection is an interesting question. It's a philosophical question, but the nature of the conditions are obviously very, very different and will bring about different demands on them, some through phenotypic flexibility, some through genetic change. And therefore, it's possibly a combination of factors that we will have to understand. Your second question was in Borajan fragment, has there been interspecific competition between Assamese macaques and uh, pigtail macaques leading to near extinction of the latter? Possibly, yes. It's very difficult to establish competition in the field, Bimal. Uh, you know, in the laboratory, we can actually see how one displaces the others. We do see evidence of what we call uh, scramble competition in the wild. And in scrambled competition, basically, you have, let's say, a troop of pigtail macaques feeding on a particular source, food source. And then an Assamese macaque group comes, and the pigtail macaque moves away. And the Assamese macaque comes and takes its place. What do you hypothesize? Has it fed enough and moved away? Or did its feeding get disrupted? And if its feeding has got disrupted, what is its next food source that it will take? Has it adapted enough to other food sources or will it go in a manner of speaking hungry, at least for some periods of time, enough for it to have a physiological effect? Very difficult to establish in the field. But we do think that there is competition and we see this in summer when much of their food resources shrink and you do find scramble competition being replaced by contest competition where animals may not move away the other troop comes and there's a physical encounter after which they move, which clearly tells you that there has been an escalation in the competition. And finally, of course, the fact that they feed on different foods, some are on the canopy, some are in the undergrowth, some are in the mid level, they feed on leaves versus roots versus flowers. They use different water resources, tells you that they are also able to partition resources amongst themselves. And that may have a sort of, uh, uh, may enhance their survival chances simply because they're avoiding competition. Right. I don't see any other questions. Uh, Purushottam ji, Usha ji, is there anything else uh, that, do you see any other questions or, or if anyone would like to ask uh, even, now. Sir, I have one more question. Sure. The field study is not very easy. Right. Um, uh, and uh, moreover, I think observations have to be made from a distance. See, they are also, uh, as you very rightly mentioned, they right. now these do come because they know we, that we are going to give them, especially now in Pachmari, they become a menace. They literally right. take it from your hand and run away. And right. they now got used to eating all this junk food. Yes. So uh, for the beginners, especially for the students right. who would uh, see, uh, be interested in behavioral ecology or this type of study. Right. So how do they make, obs because that's very important because they have to document it and then, uh, then uh, develop it further. Right. So uh, right. like, how did you initiate? Okay. So, okay. Yes. You had this question earlier also. Let me tell you, and I, this is, I would really like to, uh, enthuse uh, the younger members of our audience yes. because uh, I've now been, as I said, I've been studying animals uh, from 1991. So it's almost 30 years. And believe me, I have not carried anything with me other than a pair of binoculars and pen and paper. Right? So 
all the studies that I talked about, of course, other than the genetics that we did inside a laboratory, et cetera, are based on pure observational work. Now, there are very standard structured ways in which you can just go out into the field. You can go out into your backyard and just look at the species that are there. And I can tell you, there are an N number of questions that will appeal to you that you will see that there are no answers for. And many of these could be answered with very simple observational methods, just a baby, a, 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 a biology kit, uh, using a simple microscope, uh, magnifying glasses, you can answer a whole range of interesting questions, especially in behavior. Uh, uh, I would also like to mention here the work of uh, Uma Shankar and Ganeshaya from Bangalore, who have been very close friends of mine, who have uncovered phenomena such as parent-offspring conflict, sibling rivalry, whole range of behavioral ecological concepts in plants, just by doing simple experiments in their laboratory, not using anything sophisticated, but going back to the field where you can manipulate flowers or fruits, take away seeds, put it back together, see what impact it has. And they've been able to do a whole range of fascinating, they've been able to address a whole range of fascinating questions. So I think for many of us who are in colleges, universities, we may not have sophisticated laboratories, uh, I think our eyes, our ability to think, yes. our ability to just write can do wonders. And I think there's so many interesting questions which are not only simple, but which are very profound. These are also questions that no one in the America or Europe will be interested because they don't see these species at all. The US and the Europe, except Gibraltar, don't have any primates at all. So they, their primate work will always have to be in Asia and Africa, in South America, where they come and work. But they are our own species. They live with us. What is preventing us from trying to understand them? And I think I would really like to encourage you to go ahead and explore find simple questions that you can ask using very simple methodologies. And we are all here to help you. And I don't think you should feel diffident at all. Good science is not done through molecular biology alone. The best of science is done with an open mind, okay. just yes. by asking a simple question out there. That's all I have done since my PhD. My PhD was in molecular biology. I don't regret that. I enjoyed being in TIFR doing molecular biology but I won't go back to it. I think I'd rather go to the forest and look at a monkey yes, or, definitely. or look at a honeybee outside yeah, my window definitely. than to go to the laboratory simply because I have more things at my power in my capacity right. to do. And so I'll one more I have out of curiosity. Sure. I've seen them eating that uh, body loves lice. Is it similar to what we get on our head? Because that is one organism which I'm very interested in. I students. don't know the answer, Ushaji. I'm sorry. I really don't know the answer. Because uh, I, I have seen them eating all right. the time. They have a number of ectoparasites, and yeah. I do know that there is more than one kind. Oh, okay. uh, but whether the human head louse is also present in the macaques, I'm not very sure. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, great, sir. I, I, I think you made our evening. No, no, no. Very nice. Thank you so much. There's yeah. just some questions yes. here. Uh, I think uh, Rajkumar Divakar has asked, two people have <laughs> changed perception towards monkeys. One was Darwin and second, your lecture. Oh, <laughs> no, 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 no. no I, they're so cute. <laughs> no, no, no. Thank you very much for, uh, okay. Uh, Lata Sardesai asks, are there any Adivasis who feed on monkey meat? Oh, yes. It's not just Adivasis. I mean, uh, I mean, Adivasi, I'm not sure whether the term is a good term to use because many of these uh, have sort of implications that perhaps carry value judgments. But I'll tell you this, that if you look at local communities, monkey meat is fed in across the country, much more in the Northeast relatively than in Southern India. Uh, but amongst many of uh, uh, the communities which live in forests are dependent on forest resources, many of them uh, eat uh, monkeys. Now, interestingly, uh, langurs are consumed more than macaques are. And I don't know the answer, 
Uh, I think there are two levels of answers. One is, I, I, many of you may have heard of Dr. AJT John Singh, who's like a guru to us. He's a wildlifer who's been, in fact, uh, Dr. AJT John Singh, who now lives in Bangalore, is very close to a close friend of mine. His was the first study, a scientific study of any wild species in the wild, when in 1971, he began a study of the dhol, the Asiatic wild dog in Bandipur. So Dr. John Singh will always tell me, and that's very typically his, he will say, you know why macaques are eaten less than langurs? Because macaque meat is bitter. Langur meat is not as bitter. Uh, he will not tell me where he has eaten it, how he has eaten it, but I think he has. Uh, that's one answer. In general, what is also interesting is that herbivores tend to be fed on much more than carnivores are, right? So many of us who are non-vegetarians eat herbivores. Very few of us really eat carnivores. So there seems to be some, I don't know whether there's an evolutionary process out there, but there seems to be some stigma about having carnivorous uh, meat, I mean, as your food, I meant. Uh, that's one. And finally, the other question might be, and that's an interesting, if you look at macaques, and I'm sure many of these communities have looked at these animals, a macaque shows much more sophisticated behavior, social behavior, than do langurs. And in fact, uh, you know, when I was working in Arunachal Pradesh on the Munzala, I met a hunter. And he asked me, what is it that you see in these monkeys? And I said that, look, I see how a female monkey takes care of her young. And he said, oh, can you show me? So I showed him the Munzala mother taking care of the young, doing certain, showing certain behaviors. And he said, Main aur kabhi bandar ko nahi marunga. Itna tak aapko main bata deta hu. So I think the fact that he saw a complex social behavior, which perhaps reminded him of his own people, may have inhibited him from killing it, I don't know whether he finally did that, but he said this at that time. So therefore, I think there may be a whole range of factors, physiological, behavioral, observational, uh, philosophical, which may decide what kind of meat to eat or what not to eat. And maybe your the answer perhaps lies there. Uh, this is for Lataji. So we can uh, listen to you or... I think uh, time, there is nothing called a time and very sure uh, an excellent teacher also you are. And uh, Praveen sir, yes, sir, Captain Praveen Nayak. Yes, ma'am. Uh, can you please uh, give the vote of thanks? And I'm very uh, sure, uh, is sir. Is there any other question? If there is, yeah. I, we can take another two, three minutes. Yeah. So I, sir, I hope we, we would like to know whether you would uh, like engage a session for the undergraduates. Oh, absolutely. Anytime. Okay. Anytime. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you so much. No problem. Any other sure. question uh, anyone has? I have one question. Uh, uh, bolo. Uh, do they exhibit any kind of tool making behavior? Have yes, you seen yes. any kind? Yeah, 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 exactly. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I don't know who asked that question, but thank you very much. Sanika, here. Sanika, Sanika. Sanika. Oh, Sanika, uh, I think Sanika Gupta, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so yeah, uh, thank you for asking that question. In fact, we are just currently doing some analysis on tool making. And I'll just tell you one very interesting thing. If you look at tool making in primates, including apes, people have traditionally looked at how they use tools to extricate food right? In a food feeding yeah. context. <clears throat> Interestingly, if you look at the macaques, the macaques are all generalist um, uh, foragers. So they have therefore not, they don't really need tools because, you know, they eat everything. Every leaf, every plant, every grass can be eaten. Amongst the macaques, the most prolific tool makers in this context is the lion-tailed macaque of the Western Ghats. Because it lives in the rainforest canopy, it has very specialized food requirements. We often find it using tools. So it can use a twig to, par, uh, to prize the bark and look at insects under the bark. What is fascinating, this is a friend of mine called Gottfried Hochman, who's now in the, one of the Max Planck Institutes. 
he found that what lionel macaques also do is they take these hairy caterpillars when they find the hairy caterpillar they put it on a leaf they roll up the leaf and they rub it and when they rub it and they strip off the leaf the hairs of the caterpillar come off with the leaf and then they have the caterpillar so that's a remarkable tool use however so far anywhere across the world the only evidence of monkeys making to not apes monkeys making a tool comes from our group comes from our studies wow. on the monet macaque and what That's is remarkable impressive. and what is remarkable is that they use it in a completely non foraging context they don't use it for food acquisition we have seen across three populations now about six individuals one male five females all adults and they use four kinds they use tools for four kinds of use and they actually modify the tool one for many of the females it's a vaginal infection so what they do is they take a stick they break it into smaller pieces and then they insert it into their vagina and they scratch now what is remarkable is for one of the females that we saw she would take an entire leaf and she would take away the lamina she would take the midrib break the midrib into smaller pieces and use that for the same kind of investigation here therefore we say that she had a mental model and she could see the stick within the leaf and she uses that mental model to modify it making a tool off late dr orijit pal who is a post doctoral uh, associate working with me he has found three i had only seen up to this much i've seen three females do this but only in different populations he now finds in chamundi hills in mysore three other users he finds a male who after eating breaks a twig and uses it to pick his teeth like a toothpick he also uses a stick a modified stick to scratch a wound right and the third thing that he does very similar to that of the females is he takes very fine uh, sticks and he inserts it into his urethra right and we think that this may not be a response to an infection because we don't seem to see any infection it could be a simple case of stimulation so it could be masturbation where he takes a stick inserts it into his urethra repeatedly however we have not seen ejaculation after that so we don't know whether it's masturbation but for some reason he has got into this habit so these are the four kinds of tools and in all the cases they modified either by breaking it into smaller pieces in some cases they take it into their mouth and make it wet before using it whether that is a kind of a lubricant or whether it's cleaning the stick we don't know but this is it so thank you very much again sanika for asking me that thank, because thank you, i get a chance to much. talk more about my work <laughs> <laughs> ananya i'm sorry i have to leave i have another webinar to attend no 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 sure 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 I, thank, you webinar, thank, thank you very much we have to thank you very much thank you go thank you very much for your time thank you sir ananya, thank you ravin sir. sir thank you ravin sir mm. uh, yes sir ha dr sivan Nice seeing oh, you. Ah, Dr. Sivan, nice to see you too. Yeah. Good evening, Good. sir. Yeah. Hi, uh, uh, Kale sir, uh, Pravin sir. You yeah. always have uh, some great questions, right? Aram se puchega, Pravin. Pravin sir. Yeah. Bolie. Yeah. Yeah. Should I? Should I? Yeah. Yeah. Please. Okay. We are going to trouble sir again. <laughs> <laughs> with pleasure, with pleasure. As you can see, yeah. I enjoy talking. <laughs> sir, अभी अरुणाचली जाने का मन हो रहा है. Okay, on behalf of uh, Hindi Vidya Prachar Samiti and uh, and Ram Nirmal Junjunwala College, as well as uh, on behalf of uh, Association of Teachers in Biological Sciences, I would like to thank the speaker for the day, Dr. Anindya Sinha. for giving a very excellent wonderful talk um his talk showed not only his knowledge but the, also the in depth uh, yes. effort what he had done uh, over a lo very a long period of time in studying the monkeys um i also take the opportunity 
to thank uh, the director in the vidya prachar samiti dr usha hey, we are host come on <laughs> okay, <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, i will also like to thank uh, dr ikale uh, we are also the host man but then still uh, giving the opportunity uh, for a tie up between atbs and rjc college okay to have such wonderful lecture series in biology uh, i like to also thank uh, dr bimalendra das uh, nath sir uh, for uh, having spent his valuable time in uh, in this uh, particular lecture series uh, dr sivan as i can see and uh, all the teacher teacher colleagues of rj college as well as all Good the is. members members of atbs who was who are on the zoom app as well as on youtube uh, also thanks to all the students uh, participants who have attended this lecture on both the zoom as well as youtube uh, next time uh, what we had done to today is since we have a limited capacity and i had passed on the zoom as a link to over the ec uh, members that uh, the member teachers so who are known to us may join the zoom as well as some maybe some students but nevertheless next time we will see that this zoom app uh, link is also put up on the uh, email for atbs members so they can uh, join us but again uh, not to mention uh, not the least to mention right at the last moment i had i had to put the uh, what is it zoom link on to the telegram as well as on the email as well as on the whatsapp group and few of them they have immediately joined us on this zoom so thanks to them also uh, so i thank one and all dr yeah, sinha i think uh, as usha ji said the next time we have for the yes. undergraduate students yeah. let's we are having so on zoom because you can said we can take about 100 or 150 yes. whatever yes sir. so i think and what we can do is we can make it in discussion mode rather yes, than sir. giving a lecture so that we can address the questions on evolution ecology we can talk about some of these issues and i think an interactive session will be something i am more comfortable with and then because then you know it's just not one way uh, we can hear out the students find out where their questions are we can also sure, talk sir. about careers career choices and research and things like that we can we can definitely let's start that but sir this is also available live on our website right in a playlist so since we have it on youtube uh, we will again uh, put it on for our students so they also know a little bit and sure. then we'll have the session yes 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 that will uh, be wonderful. thank you so much sir thank, thank you very, very much and dr nath thank you pravi bye bye thank you bye bye thank, thank you biman thank you all thank you very much thank you thank sir thank you much thank, thank, thank you madam thanks everybody bye. thank you dr davra sir Yeah, so my pleasure. In fact, it was pleasure listening. <laughs> I know. Yeah.